half yeah. here. Uh, by the way, if anyone has older material that you want Jordan to sign, you'd be happy to do so. Absolutely. So, yes. So feel free to come on up. Those who haven't gotten a picture, like a picture of these two gentlemen, absolutely is also as well. So uh, I think we're going to go to the Q and A portion of the show, and I've been demanded that the first question come from Mr. Ciavella there. So the floor is yours, sir. Is the $50 partnership option still a thing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's this concept called inflation. <laughs> well, so, it's $60. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, when, when you're an entrepreneur, you're always in fundraising mode. Uh, and so yeah, <laughs> I am not fundraising for a new venture. But yeah, it's, uh, it, uh, it is uh, more, it's software, so it's more expensive. Jen, right there. And we'll, yep. Okay, two questions, one for each. A little bit louder, please. I have two questions, one for each. For Jordan, whose idea was Combots? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> that, was, that was mine. <laughs> um, uh, so Combots was a, was a board game that predates Battletech. And it was a, um, a, a, mini it was a board game, but it used miniature figures. Uh, and they were uh, kind of, um, the, the concept was gladiatorial robots. That seems familiar, but, uh, but they were not human piloted. They were kind of a, a, AI piloted. Uh, what the mechanic was very simple. There was each each layer of combat. They would go from one to three layers. Uh, was a hexagon, and you could put um, physically onto the model different weapons or shields uh, onto it. And then the premise was these things were spinning at high high speed. So then you would just roll dice to see which which piece was damaged and, and what, which piece was encountered. But it was shield, so if you had a bunch of shields on, they're more likely to they would be defensive, so on. It was a fun, simple little game, and I, I loved it. Um, and uh, and it kind of was a, it came after Grab Ball, which was also a, a, a tabletop you know, you know, game that, that, that used figurines as well, uh, and kind of a silly science fiction sport. Do you remember that, though? <laughs> so your, your second question? Um, this one's from Mike Stackpole. Who was your inspiration for Victor Steiner Day being as a character? Um, I, you know, I didn't have an inspiration for Victor per se. What I wanted to do, in, in the previous generation of leaders were all sort of very recognizable archetypes. And so with Victor, um, my real goal was to have somebody who is dealing with you're the you're the child of someone who is known for being great and incredible, and unless you're from Korea, unless you're from Korea, <laughs> right, right. But but you well, know great, everybody in the, the pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> but you know everybody in the world's going to think you're a nepo baby, or they're going to be afraid of you, or they're just going to dismiss you, and so here you get this guy who is fighting to prove who he is, really to find his own identity and find his own way. Um, and he, I also knew that he was gonna be somebody that there was just gonna be crushing responsibility thrown on him. So, you know, what I was trying to find my way through with, with Victor was somehow having somebody, the, the thing with Victor and, and sort of the, the, the touchstone for me for Victor was, if he doesn't die, he will get better. You know, so so it's like, you know, the embodiment of the, you take a shot at the king, make sure you kill him. Because if not, you know, he's still going to be there. And that's the way it was with Victor. You know, every time he got knocked down, he got he got back up, and he didn't get knocked down the same way. Um, but also having to suffer constantly being compared to living in the shepherd's body. <coughs> Absolutely. One of the most reviled, revered characters <laughs> of his age. Right, yeah. exactly. So it was, I mean, it was a real tough thing. And, and, and I can see, it was really funny. I do remember in writing uh, Lethal Heritage, I had written up a bio for, for, um, uh, for Victor and, uh, and it started writing the book. And then I went back to check a fact in the bio when I was eight chapters in, nine chapters in. And uh, his personality, I'd reversed it. I'd swapped it 180 degrees. Uh, from what I thought I was going to do because, and, and the, the character he is now, far more interesting, far more, far more dynamic. And this was, this for me, uh, you know, when, when we went to the Republic and stuff, for me the most fun was having Victor 
be the only one of those characters who was still alive. <laughs> Everybody wanted Victor dead, and somehow he outlasted all of them. Well, that's what interesting that about the characters yeah. well, yeah. that you dealt with, you got to a lot of crushing defeats oh, yeah. throughout yeah. the story, and having to deal with that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And his responsibilities, like you said. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, just, you know, just when, when he almost died on Luthien. Right. Or, well, yeah. he died on Luthien. He, 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 he got better. He got better, yeah. Right there, got better. Yeah, the... Uh, so you were talking about the pods earlier. Was the pods actually went through Fos out of business then? Is that is that how that? I'm saying the pods what? Did he try? Is that actually what drove Fos out of business? Oh, no, no, no. Fos survived that uh, barely. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, when, when the Disney family came in uh, and bought a bunch of it, uh, the company from us, that that reinvigorated Fos out, right? Um, and uh, and Fos went on for another. 10 years or more. Uh, so when I, uh, I we had started, so we, had the, we, saw, we had the pods, virtual entertainment, and then we started Fast Interactive, which was a PC-based video game company. And I moved there, was working with that, from, um, and only kind of tangentially, you know, kind of advising FASA. So when Microsoft bought that company and moved me to Seattle, and our whole team to Seattle, um, uh, I uh, started working on other game stuff, and I had this idea for this collectible miniature game concept of the dial on the bottom. Of it. And I went back to to Mort and uh, my dad and, and Ross and, and Jill, who was president at right, right. FASA at the time, and said, "I think this is interesting." And you know, this whole concept of collectible miniatures, da da da. And they were like, uh, "No, <laughs> like, <clears throat> we, we think it's too risky. We don't want to do it." I said, "Okay, well, I want to go do it by myself." And that, you know, make sure. Because I still own a bunch of pass, I'm like, okay. They said, "Yeah, go ahead. You want to waste your money? Go for it." Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so that became WizKids and Mage Knight and Hero, and Hero Clicks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then that company then went and bought Pass, uh, Pass <laughs> into into WizKids, um, which primarily was so my dad could retire, because <laughs> um, that gave him the opportunity to retire. And, and also Ross retired very young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, um, and, uh, and that's actually how Catalyst kind of really got to start, because um, uh, WizKids was not really set up to do kind of RPG style prompt, right? Um, and so uh, I licensed it to Lauren and Randall uh, to be able to right. continue that, that line where we... And the first part is Battle Core, just doing right. fiction online, yep. and yeah. Yeah. very early subscription model, and then went for the game when, yeah, when WizKids went, we got taken care of. Yeah, this this is the fun thing about about knowing Jordan when he whenever he comes up with a new idea for something, you know I there, so many times down through the years I would get a phone call from him. So I get this new game I'm doing. Jordan, I don't have time right now, but let me just tell you about it. We'll spin something out. It's like, damn it, I hate you. Send me the stuff. <laughs> I, you got that call for Shadowrun. Right? Oh yeah, no, no. Yeah. Shadowrun was I was in the office. Oh, I remember because okay. I was up, I was up, we were talking about Renegade Legion. I was going to do the Renegade Legion role playing game, which, which I eventually did. But you sat down and you said, "Oh, we're doing this new thing, Shadowrun." And you gave me this wonderful, you know, forty-five minute, you know, this this is what we're doing. It. He was so enthusiastic, and uh, you know, then we talked Renegade Legion and everything like that. And I went back to Phoenix, and and Shadowrun was just in my brain. And I went back to Phoenix on a Thursday, and uh, that Saturday, over the course of 12 hours, I wrote uh, the first piece of Shadowrun fiction, the first Wolf and Raven story. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I remember calling you on Sunday going, okay, I've got the Shadowrun story. He <laughs> said, <laughs> send it. Uh, you know, and so I FedExed it out, and Tuesday got a call saying, okay, I've sent it off to the development team. You know, and it was like, whoa. <laughs> and, and it was really, it annoyed guys on the development team because here was Shadowrun Fiction before they even finished designing you know, the game. You know? but, uh, but yeah, so, but that was, I mean, the fun thing about, about working with people who are, who are hyper-creative is, is that the enthusiasm catches. Mm -hmm. And and you get to see that, and uh, you get to see their world, and it's you know, and it sparks what you want to do, and, and and that's sort of the you you know that it, as you feel it catch fire, you know, yeah, this is going to work, 
you know, a lot of people are going to be real cool with that. I wanted to touch, before we go on, I want to touch base uh, on something you said a few minutes ago that NASA bought, I'm sorry, Microsoft bought NASA Interactive. Correct. That's why they have the death grip on the other, the gaming rights, basically. Well, yeah, so when we started Pass Interactive, um, <coughs> NASA invested the video game rights to the properties into Pass Interactive. That's how it, that was its oh, investment, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then others brought in millions of dollars. Right, right, right. Um, and so when that company got bought, Microsoft then owned Lock, Stock, and Barrel, pretty much. Yeah, they owned all the video game rights. Right. Fast and Proper owned all the other rights. Right, right. 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 And and I always wondered how that division came about. Yeah, and, and the only one that's flipped from that is, is Crimson Skies. Because um, I had created Crimson Skies while I was at Fast and Active. So Fast had the tabletop publishing rights, but that's all. And, and Fast Interactive owned all the other rights. Right. Um, which okay. was unfortunate because that's why there isn't a Crimson Skies movie. Oh, that is unfortunate. <laughs> Red, I think you had a question? Yeah, so um, I have two questions, and they're very similar questions, just directed in two different directions. For, for Jordan, what are you most proud of for what you accomplished with the franchise? Wow, hard question. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> he stole that. I was going to ask that myself. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Told> my mind. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, um, to me, I guess what I'm most proud of is many of the stories that you've told me here today, and the ones I've heard similar over the years. Right. The, the, the you know, the fact that I, I was lucky enough to create, you know, lead the creation of, because as, like, correctly said, right. This. I started the ball rolling, but it's thousands of creative people who have contributed to this over the years to make it into what it, what it is. Um, and uh, the fact that that's had impact on people's lives like other people's games had impact on my life, um, uh, to me that's what, that's the problem. Perfect. <laughs> and for Michael, which book are you most proud of that is Battletech related that you've written? <laughs> Um, I think of the Battletech books, uh, I, I see the trilogies as, as whole sets, so that would be outside that. But I think the, the book that I really, really wanted to write, and I was really happy to do, was Assumption of Risk. Because I got to uh, finish off Kay's story, or you know, bring him to a, because out, out of the Blood of <coughs> Wrensky trilogy, he's the only character that doesn't have a happy ending. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, some people died, sure. But, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I knew I had done it deliberately. You know, that the K K's ending was or K story was ending the way it was. But I also knew that that I would be able to pick it up in some future story. And so, being able to do that in a subject of risk, and that was, I mean, that was. Uh, uh, that was just a, it was a fun novel, it was fun seeing him on Solaris, and you know, it was, it was, a, it was a story that when I was reading over the first draft and going, geez, there's a lot of father-son theme type stuff in there, so, you know, the second draft went back and strengthened that, so I think that's a, I mean, I, I like all of the novels, but I think that was, that was one that, you know, you could hand somebody and go, okay, here, you know, you can read this without reading any of the other stuff. Also perfect. So thank, thank you both of you. Thank you very much. I just realized you pronounce it K. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is pronounced K. Yeah. I, uh, according to you, the author. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and according to the text. Because <laughs> yes. at least twice K tells people how his name is pronounced. But so the, the, that. Well, the, the reason for that, as I was talking to some people this morning, or, or, or last evening, uh, the reason for that was this. Um, as I was designing Victor and, and K, uh, I, I had been reading or recently read John Steinbeck's uh, Mort Arthur. Uh, Steinbeck went through and rewrote Thomas Mallory's Mort Arthur. Uh, and in Steinbeck's version, which I really, really like, uh, he referred to Arthur's brother K and spelled it C A I. And so I just went and changed it to a K A I. <laughs> and But I was very much viewing their relationship as. You know Arthur and Kay. That that okay. Kay would always be there for Victor. Now, again, I'm certain in the Saint Ives Compact, 
um, among with his mother's people and everything like that uh, is pronounced Kai, and 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 with all those implications, but K grew up in the Federated Commonwealth. That's how it would have been pronounced, and so that's how he pronounces it himself. John, okay, it's it's K in our pronunciation guy. Oh, fine. <laughs> Although that's a great explanation, so not being actually get behind it. Yeah. <laughs> spelling. But for yeah. what it's worth, the pronunciation of the guide is wrong. Let's break this down in simple words. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just without that you lose your question. No, no my no. Oh. good one. So it's fun to see you guys here as the godfathers of uh, of Battletech lore in, in the magic leather chairs and everything, but in my head. I keep thinking, like, way back in the very beginning, when this was all just twinkling in, in the mind's ideas, and you were coming up back and doing the back and forth, like, what ideas came up that you were like, no, Mike, you can't, no, no I don't like, 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 like when Victor and K and all the other characters were just the beginning of like, here's the ideas, and I was like, no, you can't, no, that's awful. They, they, I remember one time when in a meeting, there was an idea that was shot down with a vehement no. However, I was the one that said no. And I can't remember if you were at that meeting. Do you remember any, any stuff that we didn't I'm agree on? I remember. I mean, the problem is, <coughs> I, I come up with a lot of ideas, and most of them are really bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I count on people around me to say they're really bad. So I, I actually don't, there are too many of them to remember. <laughs> so I don't remember one where we're like, where we no, I'm, sure, I'm sure there were ones where we shot them down. Like, well, I mean, I mean you know, when, when we were all when we were all just you know blue skying stuff, you know, there were tons of ideas oh, that yeah, came up yeah, that, yeah. that just a lot of them you just couldn't fit in. They, we, you know, the better ideas are here, and everything sort of accretes in that arrow, and that becomes or in that direction, and and, and you get a uh, uh, you get a thing. I I do remember, um, and I think it was it was, I do think you were there. It was one of the meetings in Chicago. Jill and Sam were also there, and Bill Keith was there. Oh. This was for the this was the planning meeting for the Twilight of the Clan, and Bill was not. Bill had not been really enthusiastic with the direction of BattleTech when I came in, um, because Bill thought that I had ruined it. As many people on the internet do as well. So I you know, <laughs> just, we got the training early on, but but I remember that um, as we Bill, as you know, uh, had one of the first novels in the Twilight of the Clans, uh, doing doing what he was doing, and he wanted to take Victor and use Victor as the leader of this thing he was doing, uh, and as he proposed this. I said, no, you can't have him. <laughs> I, mean, I, and I was, and there were stunned looks around the room, and I realized that I was kind of stunned that I said that too. And I carefully explained, you can't possibly do that because the clans will have eyes on Victor, and if Victor suddenly disappears, they'll know something's up, blah, 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 blah. Um, what I was really thinking is, K is mine, keep your hands off me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No. No, you cannot play with K. But uh, uh, yeah, so that that was the that was I don't think I don't think I was in the meeting. Right. I do remember the aftermath. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of like, that's pretty nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I think really it was the bottom line is, you know, Bill was uh, you know, one of the very first writers. He was. Oh yeah, first book. Yep, yep. Um, and I think he, you know, but when you came in with the trilogies, you kind of walked away with it. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Here he is floating in his, he's floating in his pool, and I come in with a big cannonball. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so he, you know, he was still really wrestling with the fact that it, the, 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 the yeah. fictional, the fictional old had gone away from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, so Battletech has just an incredible depth of lore. Uh, Amazing art. It, it, it has so many components that make it, I think, just an amazing candidate for somebody on like a silver screen or small screen. Do you have any stories about? Someone else is the video, right? Yeah. So, uh, 
<coughs> yeah, so remember all those bad ideas that I've had? <laughs> um, Here's another one. Yeah, well, splitting, ending up splitting the rights between different companies turns out not to be a really good way uh, to have a property that you can uh, roll forward in a, in a very cohesive way uh, and do large projects like film. And so, uh, but even before that happened, uh, back even when it was table, you know, when, when we did control all the rights of FASA, I, I've had numerous, I mean, I think I've cashed like three or maybe four advance, you know, option checks, right? Which are not huge, but they're the option, you know, to, to, to make a movie. And of course, obviously, no movies have ever been made. Uh, we had, you know, uh, some good people connected to it at different points. Dean Devlin, uh, who did, you know, Independence Day and uh, many, many other uh, big movies was uh, was on board. We worked with him for years to try to get that done. We added a New Line Cinema um, for uh, for years. Um, and actually, Mike DeLuca was the uh, producer, which was the problem. Was Mike really went to take it into really weird directions, uh, uh, as evidenced by his version of Lost in Space. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so that didn't. But we went through many scripts uh, with, for that. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Spielberg was interested at one point. Uh, I was working with him on uh, our, uh, his movie, Artificial Intelligence. Um, and uh, and then we worked a lot on Crimson Skies. That was the movie that didn't get made. It was, oh my. Wow. Because uh, we actually, so Graham Ghost who wrote um, Band of Brothers, mm -hmm. and I were working on a script uh, you know, with, oh wow, this whole story would get him. Anyway, the bottom line, that never came about because Microsoft fucked it up. <laughs> he said, you know, yeah, you know I, don't, I want to do this um, movie with uh, with Big Macs um, on Earth in, in, in current day. Could we do that in Battletech? And I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and it breaks my heart to say so. But, because it just, you know, that doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? It, was, it would have, you know, it was not battle now, it's battle tech. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that and that became um, Transformers, right? He went up and, mm. and did Transformers instead because uh, he wanted to do one in the current day, so with Michael Bay directing. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it's got, we've gotten close but never gotten there. Yeah, right, yeah, right there. Okay, so back in like the 80s and 90s and, and less so in the 2000s, there were a lot of really wild ancillary products that came out for Battletech. Like, you know, the dossiers, uh, you know, the, and the prints and the battle books and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Was there we avoided any... the toilet paper, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question is, was there any product that kind of went to development and somewhere before market just did not make it? <laughs> I meant on toilet paper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> someone, someone, yeah. someone counts with that now. <laughs> We published it many years later. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to remember what I'm going to add something on that. Either that or a product that came out and you're like, we should not have done this. Oh, well, God, that's a longer list. <laughs> 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 And since we're talking about Aerotech, we're going to... No! <laughs> Too Why soon! <laughs> Why are you booing? He's not wrong! Oh my god! I, I, I will, to this day, defend my my gravitational pull system. <laughs> I thought that was elegant. Now, admittedly, the definition of elegant has changed yeah. over the years, but... Uh, we can blame time. That's all right. <laughs> I mean, there were certainly products that I was very disappointed in. Um, you know, I, I I feel like the television show, did we missed the mark badly on the television show, unfortunately. Was that, was that you think that was more studio interference or just not having no, a crystallized view of what you wanted to tell, the story you wanted to tell? No, it's our fault. It was not theirs. I mean, they, they, I mean, they gave us, uh, Saban didn't know what they was doing with this property, really. Oh and, and also, <laughs> Saban was in the midst of having this absolutely titanic hit. Um, with uh, what was it? Power Rangers. Power Rangers. Power Rangers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so they had this Titanic game. So that they, they were not focused on this at all. So, so uh, the mistake mistakes were on our side. <coughs> I'm sorry? They still came up with a pitch and theme song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the theme song. Well, I mean, you know, that's how, that's how Saban got to start, was doing music for, for shows. And uh, anyway, so, but I think we, you know, we wrote it way too old. 
right? It was much more, it was way too sophisticated for the audience that it should have been, that the toys were going to, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, uh, and so I think we were, we were not comfortable, we were not comfortable with the fact that we were now producing a line of toys for very young kids. At the same time, we were doing a show that was not designed for young kids, it was designed for our current player base mm -hmm. to a large extent. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. those two did not match well. Um, it was the first weekly show that had CG content, and our team, uh, the virtual team, was the one that was developing all the CG content for it. And when we came in, we, we sent them the first uh, episode of content for, for that. And I got a call from Saban, and he was like, we can't use this. I was like, why? It's gorgeous. He goes, yeah, that's the fucking problem. It makes my animation look like complete shit. <laughs> <laughs> this down. You have to make it look, you know, that's why we oh, had to come, that's why. That's why we oh, had to wow. come God. up with this whole rationale for why, you know, for this low poly look, oh, yeah. right? Because, that's, um, that's pretty cool. Oh, I look at her. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, I don't know. That's a very vague answer. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a pretty big one when you're hoping to break into that the new media field. So, uh, right. I, my question was going to be about the cartoon and how it came about and how is that tied up in the rights with the movies, or is that totally separate still? Yeah, no, it did. It, I, I don't think it actually screwed up the movie rights uh, or in, in any way. Um, uh, and it, it came about, uh, so we went out uh, to talk to uh, toy companies about doing a toy line for, for Battletech. Uh, and uh, our, we had, it was an agent, and was way at the time the business was done, yet an agent had gone pitch it to, to different toy companies. Uh, and uh, first uh, company called uh, Playmates was really interested. And they spent a bunch of time with Playmates, and then they said, no, we're, we're, we're not interested. And then they produced a line called ExoSquad. It right. was a direct knockoff. Yeah, not interested, just interested to rip you off. Yes, direct knockoff of Battlefield. Um, and so by that time, we had sold the line to Kenner um, and, uh, and developed the line with Kenner. And, Ken and, and kind of model in those days was that the toy company would fund the majority of the TV show. So that's why, so for Shabbat, it's a pretty, pretty low risk thing, right? they, they, because Kenner was funding the majority. Um, and uh, so that's how the show came from. Uh, and then led to a millions of dollars lawsuit with us with Playthings, because uh, we had to defend um, the rights, because we had sold them to Kenner, uh, and it was this crazy lawsuit with, with them. So when it was playthings, you were you were you were ripping them off? No, no, we were we had to we had to sue we had to sue them to stop. Oh, them. Yeah. so okay. they right had now. basically had a very similar well, item, allegedly allegedly, yeah. allegedly a similar item to the Mad Cat. Get, get well, well, yeah, I, would, well, I mean, it was some of their models were like if you look at the back of the elemental armor, right? Uh, Jeff Lobenstein was one of our artists that actually worked his initials. Into the design of the armor of the Battle Three, uh, and his initials were faithfully reproduced. Okay, but it was an accident. Nice. Yeah. yeah, coincidence. Well, sure, happened. Yeah. They, they were not very bright. I remember their their. Uh, I got a call from their lawyers because they were looking for an expert witness in, you know, we could talk about this, and the lawyer was. You know, asking me questions, sort of qualifying me over the phone and everything like that, and said, uh, "So, you know, what, you know, how do you know? Uh, how do you know all of this stuff? You know, what's your connection?" And I said, "Well, I'm the guy who designed most of the stuff that your client ripped off." <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much for being upfront with me. <laughs> that could have been a great gig, you know. <laughs> you could have been on a stand and sunk them. Oh, well, yeah, but that would have been. Well, awesome. if the check had cleared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would have been wonderful. Yeah, well, uh, everything has been asked about Microsoft and all that, but the one novel that the estate has, as opposed to like Michael and everyone, everyone no one else seems to have to give permission to have those original novels reprinted in, and in design, which means we can still buy them instead of paying collector prices. How did this one novel end up that their, the author's estate has the iron grip on it? So, in the contracts that they had, they had a very, there's, there's a thing called a reversion clause. All right. And the reversion clause says that if the book is not in print, the, author, the rights will return to the author. Now, that never should have been in a work for hire contract. 
Oh. But as it was, it was in these contracts. Because my, my dad um, came out of the publishing world and, uh, and, and found out that his dad right. with him. So that's a very standard clause in a normal right. book publishing, but not well, in a author franchise. author owns the rights to the property. Yeah. Right. 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 Not in a franchise so, right. publishing. Right. Right. But, but then that just so, makes the, uh, another question. Why didn't you just keep printing it? Well, well no, 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 because yeah. see, here's the problem is that that reversion clause was a very generous reversion clause. Okay. And so if the book was out of print for six months, it reverted. Right. Okay. Um, it was an auto reversion. It was an auto reversion. Oh. That was, a, that was oh, the issue. There's, 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 there's a problem. So, 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 you know, that book was out of print. So now all those rights go back to the, go back to the estate. And, but, but that auto reversion clause was also the reason why um, for some of us, Lauren and me especially, um, it was very expensive for Tops to re-secure those rights. All right. um, so. I, I will say, aside from the unusual ones that didn't get, I, I was so impressed by the amount of work that you guys and, and Catalyst did to re-secure all those working with Tops. And Cat Catalyst spent years tracking down to each individual author, getting new content, renegotiate. Like it was a spectacular amount of effort to get the old yeah. fiction back. And, and and I love how passionate all the fans have been to follow that because it was so much work. It's good to know it was worth it. And the lesson is never be generous. Hopefully, when they got your rights back, they paid you well. Um. I ended up negotiating, because uh, I had two different agents and yeah. stuff and all the contracts. So I'm renegotiating the, the, the contracts and, and the the lawyer that I eventually, because there was one lawyer that we talked for three years until he started ghosting me and then they finally got another lawyer when, when they got serious about doing all of this. And um, as I'm talking to this lawyer, uh, they, uh, they had secured, they, there were two strategies. One strategy would be uh, get me and get Lauren first, because we held the majority of the books, mm -hmm. and then and, and we held the, the key books, right, the the, the historical novels, uh, and then you pull everybody else in, and that's the strategy I would have pursued. They went the other way. We'll get all the other <laughs> stuff, all the small fish first, right, yeah. and then we'll come to those two later. Um, and. Uh, when the lawyer was talking to me, uh, I remember we had this conversation because I know he's bought up everything else except for Lauren. Uh, and his conversation to me is he says, uh, you know, we just want you to know that we really respect what you did in, you know, in Battletech. We respect how you, you know, that your work is, is popular and everything like that. So we're going to pay you twice as much as we paid anybody else. <laughs> And you know, like, hey, you know, this is a this is a great thing. And I said to him, I said, well, if you look at my original contracts, and you look at my sales numbers compared to anybody else's, twice as much as you paid anybody else is where we start. <laughs> and he said, I'll have to talk to to my people. And so then you know, and we went back and forth. But there was one point where you know, again, I mentioned the contracts. And he says. Oh yeah, I have them on a box in my desk, but I haven't looked at them. <laughs> and, and to me, it's like, so basically, you're just looking for a number. And and so it's like, yeah, just kept pushing. And you know, we finally reached a number, and then we threw some more money on top of it because of how Lauren's deal was going to be structured. Um, you know, also they, the asshole tax. Yeah, we did, that's basically it. Yeah. You know, I mean, literally, I remember saying to the guy, uh, I said. Let's do this, and he says, "How does five thousand sound?" And I said, "Ten sounds better." <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, I mean, if you're asking, well, yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's like, it sounds almost like you could have gone a lot higher. He would have been happy. I, at that point, at that point, we were. We, it was. I, I do remember when when uh, Microsoft bought Fast Interactive. Your father called me because there was some money that you guys owed me, and, and your father called me. He said. I got some bad news for you. You're going to have a tax event this year. <laughs> and, 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 and the settlement with Tops was a tax event. Uh, you know, so you, you were getting some serious life changing money. Yeah. I was involved in getting Bill Keats Thomas back with his right, agent. Right. And his agent, his agent Ellenberg. Great guy. Right. 
who was doing what an agent should be doing, looking out for their client. And it's like, well, I want royalty statement. I want to know what we're sold. And I'm like, I'm like, Ethan, this company has not existed for a decade. That's gone. It may be in someone's garage somewhere, but most likely those papers are gone. So right, you, can either, okay. you can either dig in your heels and not do anything with this, or you can start getting money now for your clients, you know, and just accept the terms we're offering, and that's how I got them to the table and everything. So that was the between you guys, and he was the last one. Yeah. He was doing his job. I don't, I don't hold anything against him. He was looking up for his client, like you're supposed to do. Yeah. And they're like, but it's like, we can't produce this stuff. Since we have no altering like event type of money, thank you for coming to us, little people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any other? No, no, right, actually, right here, and then we'll go back to you, Jen. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, years ago, I was wrapping up reading the Warrior Trilogy. Um, had a great time reading it, uh, but there's one thing that I did not fully uh, understand. Uh, so I immediately went to that other repository of knowledge, the internet, and tried to see if anyone else had, had come to a decision about this. Uh, I looked at the official battle forums, uh, Reddit, uh, let's see, Discord, Facebook, a whole bunch of different areas. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I, I read that article up and down. Still, still no actual like definitive uh, answer to this. So I was wondering if Mr. Sackle, could you put this to rest? Finally, if I can remember back uh, 40 years ago, sure. Okay, no, no, no sure. Um, what is the Phantom method? Hmm. So <laughs> I <think we> could. <laughs> so, uh, it's once, uh, the rules to govern it and stuff like that, I wrote up and put into the the Calhoun scenario pack and, and ran the numbers. If if you ever have, have it happen in a game, if someone were ever able to make those rolls and stuff like that, it would never happen again. All right, I mean, so, so that was that. But early on in the, in the very first rules and everything like that, they, they talked about that there was this cultural uh, a belief in the in the general population of um, the fact that mech warriors and their machines actually united became one fused okay and, and and we all knew that that was nonsense but you know with science fiction and anything like that there's always the what if what if this were to to happen at the same time, you know, I, I, I read a lot of military history, and I, I had read numerous books, uh, in, including a book of, of every Medal of Honor citation uh, that had been issued up to that point. And there, in, in pretty much every citation um, or biographies of guys who've done that, over and over and over again, uh, the the sense of the winners of that medal are that um, they knew they were dead, and their job was to make sure nobody else died, and so they just go and do incredible things, and so um, that was something that that I, again I just wanted to explore. And so that's where that went in. And at the same time, you have you have Morgan. That is a spiritual experience for Morgan. So much to the point, he exiles himself. He goes to a monastery and is really spends you know ten years trying to figure it out. And and Yoranaga, having seen it, also goes off and and spends you know. And, and these guys are on spiritual journeys to try and figure this thing out. So. So the short form is, it is a, a, a spiritual union with that machine. It's going to be incredibly rare, um, and and it's probably you know never going to happen again. Um, you know, it, I wouldn't say it's a miracle, but it's just one of those things. And it was it was fun to explore, and you see that we never bring it up ever again. This <laughs> is <laughs> what happens when you write something cool 40 years ago and you still have to justify it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's never actually resolved in the book. What happened? Like nope. why it, it happened? Can't explain. No, it, it, that was it. It was just it was just basically you know think of it as spiritual ECM. 
You know, I mean, it just, you know, the, 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 the force was strong with them and, and that, and that, you know, made other machines not able to lock. What I really so. love about that is you had Dan one of the tactics to defeat it. Yep. Like yep. Shooting through them. Yep. Like, yep. Well, I thought pick, it was like, pick another target. Was, yep. And if they're in the way, well, guess what? This is fantastic. It's yeah. amazing. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, was there, oh, Jen? Um, this is for Jordan. And um, speak. Uh, if you were to further develop how Serrano from the harebrained schemes game at the, at the, through the tail end, how would you do it? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, it'd be interesting to take them because they, they just don't really have a defendable position <laughs> still, right? <clears throat> um, and so uh, I guess you could you know, see a future where they're just going to get stuffed out again soon afterwards. So it might be interesting to see them actually try to become more of either uh, kind of a, a house mercenary company, um, you know, where they are, you know, kind of at, at large rather than trying to defend an undefendable part of space could be an interesting task. Um, or, you know, have them potentially look inward more for connections to uh, to one of the major houses and maybe in a uh, marriage of convenience and alliance uh, to you know, give them more of a defendable position. I mean, we wanted somebody that was really, you know, at risk, right? And in an environment that was not not a stable one uh, for, for the setting. So I think, you know, even though they have this kind of period victory, right? Um, it's, you know, even at the end of the game, it's clear it's not a long-term sustainable situation. Jerry, have you taken good notes on that answer? <laughs> Actually, I have, I have a question for you, Jordan. On the game, why did you create House of Ronald? Why did you not go for a bigger, like, the, one of the bigger houses? Was it, was it a matter of scale? <clears throat> it was, yeah, a matter of scale uh, and uh, and being able to, you know, to have something that we could resolve mm, in, in, the, in the scope yeah. of a yeah. reasonable length video game. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a deep cut. But I was curious about, like, the origins of, like, the system of Battletech itself is I think back to another like earlier FOSA product of Combots. Oh, they did talk about that? I'm sorry. Oh, well, we're talking about Combots in general. Are you saying that was there any connection to the two games? Well, yeah, it's because I, when I looked through that game, I saw like some like, DNA of Battletech in there with the hex base, the oh. movement, the way some of it was. Good. I saw some like primordial battle tech in that game <laughs> and was just curious about the connection and I had I wasn't here for that discussion I apologize oh, That's okay, no. uh, I mean I think there is a little primordial, primordial lose is a good way to phrase it uh, you know battle tech when I designed battle tech I was a young designer and young designers often have the problem of trying to prove how smart they are mm. um, and so uh, that <laughs> Back in the day, and I think it's still true for young designers nowadays. You know, you you would develop super sophisticated, complex systems to prove how smart you were, and that you could model and simulate all these different things, which is what BattleTech kind of was, right? Later in life, you start to realize that actually, simple games are much harder to make than complex games, um, and uh, and but I was too young to understand that at the time. So it was, you know, Combat actually was a much simpler game, right? And I didn't think, you know, didn't think much of that at the time. I was like, oh, I, I need to make something much, much more pretty and sophisticated and, and, and deep, uh, which is where the inspiration for Battletech came from. The some the, the mechanics stuff was, um, I mean, like the whole concept of heat was that I, I wanted to look for a governor, right? A way that you actually had to think about combat. You could just go in and be gun blazing all the time, right? Which which there are a lot of combat games where just you know there was no no reason Cons uh, no consequence yeah there's no consequence to your constant aggressive action um, and so I wanted the, the governor from that side the game is also completely ablative right like you are most powerful powerful at the start of the game mm -hmm. right and it just downhill from there and that was I think that plays really fun on the on the tabletop it actually became a real problem in the video games. Right, because video games quickly became about, you know, enhancement over play rather than mm. just degradation over play. Right, because uh, you know your sessions end on more of a whimper than a bang. Right, um, and uh, and so you know, 
again, lessons learned over, over time. Well, Battletech intended to try, was trying to be a very kind of, quote unquote, realistic, um, you know, military game. Of course, ignoring the concept of, of surface tension. Yeah. <laughs> back to this is a universe with no air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did Tops end up buying with kids? Because I remember when, oh. right after Tops did, you had all these, I remember the, um, you had punch out card games, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Spirits of the Punishment, yeah. and it seemed like it was doing really well. And all of a sudden, Tops bought it, and then very quickly they said, "Voice Kids is closed." And I'm like, well, what? Well, it wasn't. Yeah, it, I mean, it wasn't that. It wasn't that close. But yeah, so we, the company, um, so I, after FASA had decided they didn't want to pursue the idea, I went and raised money. As I said, ben, you know, you're always in fundraising, and so I went out and raised money to start Whiz Kids. Right. right? Uh, and Whiz Kids went crazy, grew really quick, became one of the biggest companies in, in the industry at, the, at, the, at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, we started getting inbound, inbound offers for acquisition. And, you know, my investors were like, this is why we invested. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <really wrong. Okay. laughs> we like, yeah. So, um, uh, so we, sold, we sold the company to them. Uh, and uh, that, I mean, we continued to do very well inside of Tops for, well, I was there for another uh, three years after the acquisition. And that continued to go on. And things like, you know, the, I really had fun doing the Pirate <coughs> Punch Out games. I thought those were, those, I, uh, I really enjoyed those, and they did very well. One more, right, right there. So, um, do you still play, you said you get started with this from D&D. &D. Do you still play D&D, &D or any of those, you ever make time for whatever want to play, or ever still mess with any of those little, like, do you still play Battletech at all, ever? Do you still mess with any of those, <laughs> the board game stuff at all, or just, just Oh, play? yeah, you know, we, we play board games all the time in our house, uh, but, you know, most of the time, I'm playing with my wife and, and our friends, uh, and so they're, they're lighter games. Than, than you know Battletech, so most of the time I get to play Battletech uh, or D and D or whatever is is more of like getting together with old friends every you know couple times a year rather than you know the more lighter games which we we play you know several times a month you know um, so yeah uh, but I I love the magic of game ball and, and all so uh, I wish I had a I'm actually <laughs> recently moved to. Uh, a, what they call an active retirement community. <laughs> um, and uh, even though I'm not retired, but my wife is. And so uh, uh, they, I've been thinking about start a, starting a DD club there just to see. <laughs> That's like you know, next to the peanut Well, club. I have the peanut club and the Mahjong, you know, and then there's the, you know, the ukulele club and DD. Um, you know. Michael Jordan, thank you so, so much for taking this time, we really appreciate it. And this has been a fascinating, fascinating conversation. Thanks again. Remember, you have to be a subscriber and leave a comment. Crowdfunding is when lots of people give you small amounts of money to help your passion project come to life.